Thank you all for joining the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. I pray that your time with us will prove to be a blessing to your life. Uh, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, helping us over the years and uh, we realize that uh, there's no way we can possibly uh, recall all of the many times that you've blessed us in our efforts to feed your people. But again, we need your help. Uh, we ask that you would please guide us by directing our thoughts during the delivery of this message and then give the increase for all of us to learn what you're saying and to understand it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This week we're talking about uh, the demolition ball is approaching. The demolition ball is approaching. Y you understand uh, the concept of a demolition ball. It, it usually uh, the big crane uh, and the operator will swing the ball over one direction and allow it to fall back to the other direction for the purpose of knocking a building down. Well, uh, the demolition ball is basically just a topic to try and give us a picture of what could possibly be going on in this day and time. Uh, not so much to totally destroy uh, anything, but to uh, knock it down and then start over uh, and make it into something more beautiful and more useful. Uh, so. That's the idea behind the demolition ball is approaching. Now our text comes from Isaiah chapter six, verse four. The English standard version says, and the foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. The same verse, Isaiah chapter six, verse four uh, in the King James version says, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now the effects of the seraphim's call uh, uh, also in the book of Amos chapter 9 verse 1, it talks about the shaking of the doorpost and the threshold as an indication of the beginning of uh, a demolition in essence. And if this is the case, uh, then the smoke could be the result of the destructive force at work. And then the cry of the seraphim could be a warning of the imminent destruction, which is a consequence of God's holiness being compromised by his people. Now, however, everything is in line with how the Lord works. And the salvation of the Lord takes place in phases or as I often say at Mount Sinai, it's a process. It's a process of, first of all, justification that took place on Calvary, where Jesus died in our place to pay the price for our, sin, our sins, which, uh, which uh, made us justified in God's sight. In, in other words, he freed us from the penalty of sin. And then the next process, which we are in uh, now, is the process of sanctification, which frees us from the power of sin. We are being freed from the power of sin day by day. And it doesn't matter that you might think that you're totally holy and everything, but if you say that you're without sin, then you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. And I'm not the one that's saying that. That's what the Bible says. And that to truth be told, all of us are still sinning on a daily basis. Uh, we might not sin as much as uh, some other person does, but uh, uh, there's so many ways to sin. And, and, and if you think that, that, that the Ten Commandments is the only way to sin, then you need to go back to uh, Sin 101, Class 101. Uh, so we are being set free or sanctified from the power of sin. And then when uh, Jesus returns, we will be set free uh, from the presence of sin for we will go through the glorification process where the glorification process is, 
it, it, it's all about being with God. So with that point, we will be with God. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Now it's better, pro uh, probably better to see uh, smoke and trembling doors as accompanying the theophany. A theophany is a manifestation of God in the Bible that is tangible to the human sense. It's putting uh, uh, God in a, and at him at work in a sense that we can better comprehend what's going on. The greatest biblical example of a theophany is, is mankind and Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. The, the, uh, the trichotomy of uh, God, and, and that's what it's talking about, uh, basically three, trichotomy, uh, body, soul, and spirit, just as there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mankind created in God's image is a trichotomy and we are made of body, soul, and spirit. Now Hebrews chapter 1 verse uh, 3 and the New Living Translation says the Son, that's Jesus, radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God and he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. So there Jesus is as the expressed image of God. Uh, 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 every the character, uh, everything about God is found in Jesus. Now, now uh, Jesus was, was God uh, uh, in bodily form. I'll put it that way. He, he took part of our nature. He became flesh and blood like we are, yet without sin. So the great theophany, another example of the great uh, theophany is uh, on Mount Sinai where God was visible in the smoke around the mountain and also at the tabernacle of the pilgriming uh, Israelites in the wilderness. Both instances are examples of God's presence. And, and now with that information, let's connect uh, our text to Israel and the prophet Isaiah and to us in this day and time. And remember, we're talking about the demolition ball is approaching. Uh, Israel had sinned and placed their trust in other nations or other leaders of other nations and consequently other gods. Isaiah had relied on King Uzziah and the throne he occupied. And we in this day and time in many ways can't see our own sinfulness as long as we are able to find someone else uh, who is more sinful than we are uh, in our own eyes. Then we are close and uh, uh, we think that we are close to God as long as we can find somebody else sinning more than we are, then we think that we are close to God. We deceive ourselves into thinking that we, we, we're, we're close to God and, 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 and that's close enough. That's the, that's the way we feel about it or we act about it. As long as the threshold of the door of our houses and there uh, are not shaking, and there's no smoke visible, then we feel that there's no problem. The earth's pestilence in this day and age, COVID-19, just as the pestilence uh, went into Egypt, it just might be a wrecking ball to, 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 to destroy so that God can rebuild. And the COVID-19 doesn't say that God is, uh, 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 does not say that God is preparing uh, to do some demolition work in our lives, but I'm just saying, earthquakes, 
are taking place in other states and countries, not where we live. All those fires are burning in California and other places of, like Australia, not where we are. We don't have anything to worry about. Maybe God is talking to them. But then maybe God is talking to all of us through those situations. God is able, if he wanted to, to shake our own little individual worlds and can tailor how he decides to manifest himself as he demolishes our lives so that he can make us over into instruments that are useful in his service. There's a story in the book of Jeremiah that tells the perfect story to fit this uh, uh, Bible lesson or this sermon. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1 through 12, and I'll read the English Standard Version. Uh, the book of Jeremiah, if you want to get turned to it right quick, uh, chapter 18, and we'll start reading at verse 1 through verse 12. It's a story about the potter and the clay, very familiar story. Verse 18 says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord said, arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my word. So, so, so note what's taking place here. God is telling Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house so that he can hear his word. But now notice that right where Jeremiah is, he's also listening to God. God is telling him verbally to go down to the potter's house. So why do we need to be at the potter's house to hear what God has to say? Maybe God wants to give him a picture. He wants to give it in video and audio. Uh, verse, two, uh, verse three says, so I went to the potter's house and there he was working at the wheel and the vessel he was making of clay was marred a spoil in the potter's hand and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Note now, he says in verse five, then the word of the Lord came to me. Now he had received this video of looking at the potter and now God's want to explain to him, I believe, the video that he had seen. He says, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done? Declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turn from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it so that God gives us a way out. He always gives mankind a way out. Verse 9 says, if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight and not listen uh, to my voice, then I will relent and do the good that I had intended to do to it. I will, if, if they will not listen to my voice, then I will relent. I will change my mind of doing the good that I had intended to do. In other words, God will change his mind from doing good and do them destruction. Verse 11 says, Now therefore say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return every one of you from 
his evil ways and amend you your ways and your deeds. But they said, that is in vain. We will follow our own plan and will everyone act according to the stubbornness of his own evil heart. Are you getting the picture so far? Now let's see if I can I, I can I can uh, give us a picture of us in this day and age. Now, Facebook can be a very useful tool. Now, mind you, this is an example. This is a video picture of us. Last uh, week, I connected a member of the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church that I pastored for 19 years. Uh, he haven't been a member there all of that time, but he's been, he's, he, he's, uh, he has been there and he's very useful to the ministry. I uh, learned that he's the first cousin of one of my classmates. We graduated together. Now, the member of Mount Sinai, he grew, he grew up in Memphis. His first cousin and I grew up in Helena, Arkansas. And I never put the two together, even though they had the same last name. But I was looking at my classmates' uh, Facebook page, and there, or was it the other way around? Uh, either one way or the other, I was looking at one of their Facebook pages and saw the other one, and I said, wow. And then the last name clicked to me. And so I called, made a few calls, and, and it ended up they were first cousins. That's a good use for Facebook. That, that a few years back, uh, I had a cousin that I had not seen in years. I'm talking about probably 30 or 40 years. And I saw this name. Uh, Sometimes Facebook would suggest uh, people that you might want to be friends with. And I saw his name and, and I reached out to him. And he was my long lost cousin. So Facebook can have some good uses. But now, on the other hand, Facebook can be very deceptive by presenting the view of ourselves the way we want others to see us. We even uh, buy into thinking that the person on Facebook is not just the person I want to be, but it's the person that I am. And you all know how we pose and, and we put we present ourselves in the best possible way, much like we do on, on our resumes. You know, if you got fired from a job, ain't no way you're going to put, I got fired from this job. I worked there three days and got fired. Why did you get, you, because in the interview, you're going to have to explain why you got the, got fired. So, so we have a habit of, of presenting the best us. And God wants us to see the real us. Now, reality TV is another one that can serve the same purpose. If we happen to be a boss, for instance, on a reality show, that can carry over into real life and we can be deceived into thinking that we are even above the law and can fire people at will and, 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 and without any due process. All I'm saying is, it's easy to see others' shortcoming and overlook our own. In my mind, it requires that I reconcile who I am uh, uh, with who I am, who I want to be. My mind requires that. My mind won't let me act like I'm one person on Facebook and, and, and that's really who I am. My mind requires that I keep a good picture of who I really am. 
And one of the ways that 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 the Lord makes sure that I, I, I'm always aware of who I really am, a sinner saved by grace, is when I go down on my knees, my conversation with God is not nearly as good when 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 I recognize my uh, sinfulness and my need for God. And then when I go to his word to study, I see myself like I've never seen myself in a mirror even. So my mind, as I, as I go to God in prayer, as I go to him in his word, as I seek to talk to him, as I uh, 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 position myself so that he can talk to me, it reconcile means to who I really am and will not allow me to be in life, go around putting on the facade of who I want to be. Reality has a way of catching up with us. There's a story in the book of Numbers of uh, God instructing a tribe of the Israelites when they were about to go in uh, to the promised land and conquer it, uh, this tribe promised to do as God had instructed them concerning helping out their brothers to conquer their portion of land. They said, we'll do what you say do, God. But what they promised to do, they did not do. Now, they didn't go up to God and admit that, well, God, you, we, we really didn't do what we promised to do. And neither do we have to. God knows. So in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, he, 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 here's what helped me a whole lot. It says, but if any of you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. So we can sin by omission or commission. And the verse goes on to say, and be sure your sin will find you out. You can't run from your sin. Your sin is always right there. You turn right, it turns right with you. If you turn left, it turns left with you. It's a matter of sin is a matter not of race, creed, or color, of national origin, or political affiliation, or sexual preference. Sin is sin. And be sure and very sure that your sin will find you out. Your sin will catch up with you and God will reveal it to you. The good thing about this sermon is the face, is the fact that the potter is the Lord. And when we get broken, he can start over, put some water to the clay, and recreate us into useful vessels. Jeremiah 18 and 4 says, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. And that's exactly what God does with us. We are in his hand, and I'm so glad that I'm in his hand. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And his Son gave his life on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary, so that I can have life and have it more abundantly. His Son gave his life to pay the price for 
our sins. He died as they crucified him on that old rugged cross. They buried him in a borrowed tomb. But here's where the demolition of our lives changes. On the third day morning, he rose with all power in his hand, power to work us into useful vessels. We are in his hand, and he has the power to change us from what we are to what he is. He became sin in our place so that we could become the righteousness of God. We're like a butterfly. We might have to go through some toils and some dangers for our wings to become beautiful and colorful. but he's changing us from that moth into something beautiful that can fly free. Well, that's it for tonight. The demolition ball is approaching, but fear not. The Lord wants to make us better than we are. Let us pray. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for showing us the truth about ourselves and not leaving us in our sinful state. Please continue your process of sanctifying us so that one day we can be glorified with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week, and I pray that you had a wonderful Independence Day celebration yesterday and that you didn't overdo it. Uh, life is so much better. I'm, I'm saying this as one that have done my share of overdoing it, especially with desserts. But life is so much better when we don't overdo it. And that's what any. So take care, be safe. So many states and cities are, the, the number of new cases of the coronavirus is increasing. So let's, let, let's practice uh, wearing masks, safe distancing, and washing our hands often. It's so easy not to do what's necessary to save lives and even our own lives. So I plead with you, please be safe. So long, we'll see you next week at the Lord's will. Bye-bye.